Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Start Local, the podcast focused on helping businesses in Chester County, PA, and the greater Philly area as we try to navigate through the COVID-19 economy. My name's Joe Casabona, and before I bring my fellow co-host Liam in, I want to tell you all about our newsletter, Start Local Monthly. You can sign up for this very free, very monthly newsletter over at startlocal.co slash news. And it will bring you insights that we've learned on this podcast on a monthly basis, as well as news from around the county and the greater Philly area. So if you want to know things that are going on, programs that might help you in your business and general tips, head on over to startlocal.co slash news. That's startlocal. Dot co slash news. All right, now let's bring in my fellow co-host, Liam Dempsey. Liam, how are you today? Morning, Joe. I'm doing fantastic. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Always glad to be on the microphone with you. And today, our guest is Yardell Perkins. He is the founder and head developer at Perkatech. Yardell, how are you? I'm doing great. Very humbled and honored to have been invited on. Our pleasure. Liam and I both know you, Yardell, through the local WordPress community. You served as a co-organizer on WordCamp Philly last year, and you've I've met you through the meetup. So we're glad to bring you on to talk a little bit about what you're doing and how you're managing uh, in 2020. But before we get to all of that, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, again, my company is Perkatech. The motto, which I may be dating myself a bit with, is let us build your soapbox. And I assist individuals and organizations with either creating or reestablishing their digital presences. Usually, that's through any combination of a website, branding, or digital marketing plan. Gotcha, gotcha. So these are so you say establish or reestablish. So uh, I'm I'm interested. I'm sure a lot of people are trying to establish a better online presence. But when it comes to reestablishing, what exactly does that mean? You take their current presence, look at it, see what needs to be updated. Do you start from scratch? What's How's that look? Well, typically that involves maybe some type of audit of what they currently have. It's actually part of a new package I've started to like put together an offer because it was something I, I would just fall into a certain clients where they were come to me saying, Hey, I want this new website or I want these new socials. And I'll look around and say, no, but you have, you already have these. And it's like in one place it would say there are this, in fact, for a realtor, I was just helping in one place. It said he was at Remax. And another place that said he was at century 21. Mm. There was another third social that had them at a place he had never done work at. So <laughs> interesting. It was basically, no, we, you have this, you have access to it. Let's just reorganize everything. So all says you're in one place. When it was done, we shot a video, which I just posted on my socials where he basically says, hi, I'm so-and-so I'm at this place. I do this. I'm at so-and-so call me. I'm at so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So that's that's cool. So it, it sounds like you you audit what they have, and then you also kind of create a consistent message for them, which I know is uh, super important. Um, which is which is very cool. So uh, thanks for that intro, Liam. I'll turn it over to you for the que- for the first question, at least. Thanks, Joe. You're now, but before we hit the record button and went live here today, uh, we were chatting a little bit about how you started your business. Uh, what'll be four years ago in November, and. We heard on the show that we 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 published this morning with Mark Avery, who runs uh, kind of the KSQ Barber Lounge down in uh, kind of Square, that he's hearing folks say in the chair a lot that a lot of them are looking to start their own business or take their career in a new new direction. Can you tell us what you needed to do in terms of logistics? Kind of a quick laundry list of what did it take to get your business up and going, and then maybe touch a little bit on how did you know that going into business for yourself was going to be something that that you really wanted to do and that the timing was right? Sure. Well, to make a bit of a long story as short as possible while hitting on all the high points, my previous paid job, I was working as a system administrator for an an organization called McGlink in Montgomery County. And basically it was a nonprofit where all of the libraries in Montgomery County got together and decided they wanted their own IT department. 
so they could share equipment, make orders in one place, get orders from one place, and all the rest of it. And I came there from Break Fix, and I really loved it there. I loved my boss. He was very supportive of my move into my own agency here, and he actually helped out with it in a lot of ways. And I wanted to, well, to make it short, it's I was getting burnt out working there. And I wanted to move into something of my own, but I wasn't quite sure what that would look like. I came across a website, a gent by the name of Rob Cubbin, and he talked about going into digital work. So like technically you could work from anywhere. And one of the things he talked about was getting your runway ready, where you put together enough money where you can just kind of live off for six months to a year and not do anything but focus on the work. So in one of my last years at McLink, I got my tax refund back after all the machinations of the IRS happened, and it was about $1,900. I didn't really have anything I needed or wanted to do with the money. So I said, you know what, instead of just putting it in my savings account and sitting on it, let me try putting it into Bitcoin and turning it over. So I got a Coinbase account. I threw $1,900, and I didn't think too much of it. And this was when Bitcoin was just kind of blowing up. About two or three months later, I was up about 60 grand. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. Outstanding. <laughs> so to the, the kind of merge into the question about when the timing was right, I was... That's the right time then, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I said, you know what? I'm not getting any younger. I've learned everything I'm going to need to learn. Let's just take everything I have and run with it. And the funny story I like to tell people about that time is... Shortly after I broke out on my own, which was November 3rd of, I believe, 2013, it's, it's an anniversary for me now, there was another crypto you may have heard of, which was getting pretty big, called BitConnect. <laughs> 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 kind of like, and they had this scene with like Carlo Matos, and he's running across the stage like, BitConnect! <laughs> <laughs> and I saw a lot of people talking about it, and... It's to me something about it's just smacked like pyramid scheme. But there's these big crypto guys talking about say, yeah, it looks like a pyramid scheme, but it's not. So that's what said, everybody in a pyramid scheme says. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it was this one Tuesday night. I had this whole 60 grand. I was about to transfer it into BitConnect. Something in the back of my head said, because it was starting to go down, but I thought it was kind of a dead cat bounce, they call it, where like something falls. But then it was like comes back and then comes back up. I said, give it a week. Maybe it'll come back. That week happened to be a week where BitConnect fell apart. <laughs> wow. So I said, fine, let me let me just keep it in Bitcoin. A month later, Bitcoin started to crash naturally on its own. So I was panicking to get as much as I could out. So when I was done, I had about 30 grand out. But it's like, you know, fine. This is still one year, so <laughs> yeah. still a fantastic return on a nineteen hundred dollar investment. Absolutely, right, so. <laughs> well played, sir. Well yeah. played. I will never forget the day uh, or the uh, the time. It was two thousand eleven. My friend messaged me and said, "Hey, we should get into Bitcoin." And I was like, "Nah, man, that doesn't make any sense to me." And then a few years later, like I I thought about it every day for a while. Every time it was like Bitcoin crosses whatever. I'm like, ah. Could have got in for like a hundred bucks. Um, in any case, are you still into the crypto scene or was that kind of like a one and done thing to get your runway for your business? That was, I'm a little bit into it now, not too much. I'm, I'm following Ripple a lot as of late, but I don't really try to chase like altcoins or Bitcoin the way a lot of day traders do. That was mm -hmm. kind of a one and done. It was kind of a serendipitous thing where it gave me what I needed to focus on the business. And that's where I'm hoping to make my brand, my money at nowadays. Yeah. Let me circle back on that. Cause you, you shared on the timing. That was a great story. I've not heard that before. I love that. <laughs> but now you had, you had the capacity, you had the the financial space, if you will, to, to take a risk on your own business. What, what were next steps then? Did you, did you fly all on LLC? Did you, what did you do? How'd you get off the ground? Well, actually, the, the LLC itself came about a year prior to me leaving. And 
in the year up to that, I was basically just studying everything I could on Udemy, like self-teaching myself. And I was picking up projects through a platform called Catch a Fire, which is essentially like a volunteer job board for creatives, where if you just want to, you can find nonprofits to do web work or graphic design or grant writing for. So like they, the nonprofit that needs to work done, but probably can afford it gets in exchange. You get to build your portfolio. And I met a couple of great people in my first projects there that I ended up doing paid projects for. And again, my boss, who I was last working for, his name is Sakrit Goswami. He was the executive director of the nonprofit. He's now a library director in, in the library of Haberford. He, again, he couldn't have been more supportive. Like he would, he would give me like time at work to kind of just like build the business and work on things. And his thing was always, look, as long as all your other work is done on any given day, you're not doing anything else. Read the books, chase clients. It's like, it's proud of you. I'm great. I wish I could be doing this. <laughs> so he was kind of living through me a bit. <laughs> that kind of support's really invaluable. My last boss in 2004, 2005 was quite similar where, you know, she knew what I wanted to do and don't cut corners on your day job. I'm paying you do it. But if you've done everything and you've done it well, then yeah, of course, do what you need to do. Of course. That's really important. Makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? Yes. And in fact, the only, I had actually resigned. I was going to leave September of that year. But when I went to talk to my boss about it, he basically said, and I didn't notice until he told me, he was making plans to go to this convention at the start of October. And it was, if I had tried to leave then, he would have had to stay. And it would like threw all these monkey wrenches everywhere. And he said, Yardell, listen, I get it. You're burnt. You're gone. You're tapped. If you leave now, a whole lot of things are going to be screwed up. Just can you just come in for about two more months and just sit in the seat, do what you can. If you just come and sit in the seat and you just like slump over, fine. You can't leave yet. Please. Sit. So, okay, fine for, for you, Secret. It's like, I'm, I'm a, and for those next two months, I came in and it's not that I was like, no, screw the work, screw everybody. I, can, I loved the work. I loved my coworkers. It was just, I was that gone. I would just, I just came in and it was just like, <laughs> yeah. it's a, it's, it's almost like a senioritis effect, right? Like you're, yeah, yeah. you're mentally checked out. I'm sure your bosses could tell. And when I left my job, my last, um, my job at the university, um, my boss knew as soon as I walked in her office, she knew what I was going to say. Um, but it's so great. You know, your boss supported you. And then, uh, when, when he asked you for a little extra support, I'm sure you were more willing to give it. My, my boss at that particular time was not very kind. <laughs> she was, uh, very upset that I was leaving and, and let her emotions show. And, you know, it left a little, a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth. So having that support, works both ways um, because you can, you can maintain a good relationship that way. Yeah. And I, and on the last day I have all, I have these pictures and there's one on my Facebook page. I had the typical like white box of all my stuff in it. Took a picture next to him and yeah, on my way out, I, I was being escorted through the networking <laughs> room <laughs> to make sure I wasn't going to pull. I was mm. like, <laughs> <laughs> Like here's the key card, here's the keys, yeah. the doors are locked behind. <laughs> yeah. But it that's procedure and I get it. But sure. <laughs> sure, sure, right. sure. At least you were able to have fun with it. Yeah. yeah. Yardell, I want to talk about something that might have been less fun. And it's really uh getting into how you've been dealing with COVID nineteen as a business owner. You you had a few good years before COVID nineteen and you're you're able to grow the business and get the client base and go beyond uh, charitable work through that 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 website and and really taking the business in the direction you wanted. What did COVID? What does COVID nineteen look like for your business, and how have you responded? The short answer is that COVID looked like a situation where there was an you have like an arrow and a bow and quiver, and it's pulling back. It looks like things are going down, but then it immediately shoots forward and things go up. And to elaborate on that, I've been working closely with 
of mortgage lender and a real estate investor, a gent by the name of Joe Scaris, who and I've been largely helping him with his with his RIA and his events and through helping him while still having my own business, I kind of fell into the niche of, well, happily fell into the niche of assisting realtors and real estate investors. And we've worked very closely together the past couple of years. Up to the point of COVID, we were starting to kind of look into how to make his events more virtual. So we wouldn't have to run around and do things on the scene so much, which we enjoyed, but there were weeks when that was getting taxing because we had so many events to do. We had all the equipment. We had this three-month plan. We were, going, we were going to slowly ease into it. It was going to start in March, but then when COVID-19 hit, a lot of those plans got broken down and falling apart. So we sat down and said, okay, we kind of have to go virtual now. So essentially, the three-month plan kind of turns into three weeks. We're scrambling to try to figure out how to keep certain things going, but just have them go completely online. So it was essentially the, because a lot of the people, we had RSVPs for events people really wanted to see and attend. And they were asking us, hey, is this event going to be virtual now? Because we still want the information. It's like, you can keep you can keep our ticket money. Just t- f- tell us the Zoom link, the Facebook Live, whatever. We still want to talk to this guy. We won't still want to present. So essentially, kind of the, the silver lining of the cloud fell on top of us. So we, once we figured something out, and we learned very quickly, it was, it was a baptism by fire, I like to say. People started to see what we were doing, and we actually ended up getting more work because we were one of the few who seemed like we tripped, but we almost immediately got back up on our feet. Wow, what a great story that that it sounded like it was a stressful month, but once you caught yourself and found a rhythm, it's worked out for you. Yes, in fact, in one of our very first recordings over Facebook Live, we were doing at 2424 Studios in Fishtown, and it was literally like I had one of their iPhones sitting on this special holder on top of like a camera mount and it was Facebook Live and you saw it on Facebook, it was like shaky and rickety and people are saying you're shaking and we can't hear you and we can't see you (laughs) (laughs) and we were just running with it and every time it's like, okay, we need a better iPhone, we got a better iPhone a little better, it's like, hey, how about we get an actual camera instead of an iPhone (laughs) (laughs) Yardell, what you're sharing is something that was very similar to what we heard from Don Reed Jr. Uh, in a previous episode, talking to to when he's talking to his clients, just do something. If it's iPhone, just do it and just get it out there. And you'll sounds like you did and, and landed very well. Just learn on the fly, and something is better than nothing. And get it out there and and, and connect with customers. And if they're giving you feedback, you know at least they're watching. Right, so you, exactly. You can learn from that. Yeah, I, I want to follow up with that because what was that transition like? I mean, you know, traditionally when I think of realtors, I think they're doing uh, house showings and you got to go to the house and walk through it and ask questions. But what was what was the move to virtual like? Was it more uh, your clients are giving advice online or are they going into a house, kind of doing a virtual walkthrough and making that available? What What, what was the transition like? For me, the transition was more so realtors were giving advice online about particular neighborhoods, how they were starting to be affected, and what inventory was like. I've seen a couple other realtors where they do kind of like the mastermind groups talking to other realtors in spaces similar to what we're doing now. One in particular was doing, we were we were on another podcast, and she was talking about potentially doing live walkthroughs of houses where And she was asking me for advice where I was basically saying, you may want to have a situation where the two of them are in a Zoom room and she's walking through with Zoom on her camera and she has someone on the side, like taking questions where it's like, hey, can you walk into that room? Hey, show me that. And I think she actually started doing that. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great way to do it. Right. Because it's almost like an open house. But. Instead of it being pre-recorded, now you can say people who are watching and say like, "Oh, I want to get, a, give me a closer look at that tub. Like, is there mold on that tub or whatever?" <laughs> right. Cool. In fact, there's there's a monthly 
well, it was a van tour that Joe used to do where he gets everyone in a van and he tours around to various different houses for sales to show investors how to vet houses and basically, okay, this is a good deal for these reasons. This is a bad deal. This is an okay deal if you know what you're doing. If you're first time, don't try to do a deal like this. And again, because of COVID and now the quarantine, he's still doing those tours, but now the it's gone from van tour to caravan tour, whereas no one's getting in the same vans. Like we all go to one place, everyone files their cars from place to place, and we're starting to record those so we can put those online. In fact, there's one I'm close to finishing post production on now where we run out all these places and I walk through the house looking around and while I'm walking through certain points, I have Joe and the GC talking. I was like, okay, this is what the mechanicals in the basement look like. And this is the realtor says, this is what the house costs. And then Joe steps in and says, yeah, that quote's too high. Is this, is that. You go to a seller and say, look, these are comps in the neighborhood. I'll give you this. You say no, you can say no. I'll come back in a month and I'll still offer you this. And then you'll be begging me for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've talked a lot about digital work, video work, transitioning to COVID-19, uh, particularly as it, as it pertains to, I guess I'll call it education within the realtor, reality sector. And you started earlier in the show talking about how you've been looking at packaging some kind of new video-focused service. And uh, if the three of us know, because we work on the internet all day long, video's huge, but it's still relatively early days in the grand scheme of things. You know, yes, the high-end producers, the big companies have amazing videos. But it sounds like you're really at the point where you're working with small and medium businesses, individual realtors, to try to help them harness the power of video in a budget that isn't 10000 for a 30-second video. Are you, are, am I right in understanding that you've got a new service or you're putting that together? And if so, can you kind of sh- tell us what that looks like to kind of help our, our listeners get an understanding of the, the support that's available to them if they need it? Yes, that's correct. It's video service, also kind of offerings and the social media standardization because yeah, once I standardize or build someone's social media, it kind of helps us. There's something to put on the channels. And one of the best things is video. And there are a lot of other video organizations who do work much better than mine, admittedly, because I recently just got into this myself, but they're kind of hard to get to these days. And if you can get somebody, they're charging way more because, which you can't blame, there's a lot of other considerations I have to think of. And they would come to me and basically say, hey, Yarda, I saw you doing video work at this event. Can you just shoot some simple videos for me and so I can get on my socials or add my socials? And I would tell them, Yes, I do this work, but there are other people who do much better than me. Like at my best, I may be, my work is maybe B minus. I know some people who, whose worst is B plus, but they basically say to me, listen, I I, I need C plus and I'm happy. It's like, I just want to get something up. If you can do it, if it's C plus, it's you, I'll come to you and I'm sure you'll get better. And so they start, yeah, for the smaller stuff, they come to me. If they start to talk about more intricate or advanced stuff, it's, look, whoa, it's, I, I'd love to help you, but you really want to talk to these other people I know who actually, who do this stuff all day in their sleep, recovering from hangovers. The way I do websites all day in my sleep while I'm recovering from hangovers, because they're that good. And I have no problem saying that and referring to them. <laughs> That's really interesting, right? Because it's, it's great that people are coming to you and they they trust your honesty and they know what they're getting, right? And this is, anybody who starts freelancing is going to be in this position, right? My first website was terrible, but my client just wanted a website cheaply and I was able to provide that for them. So it's great that you're willing to try new things and you're honest and upfront with your clients and manage those expectations and they're willing to work with you, but then you also know your limitations, right? Correct. In fact, one of my prouder moments in my earlier freelancing career, which it was a bullet to bite when it happened, but I bet it was in my first year, someone came to me. I don't know how they found me. They basically said, hey, 
I know you do websites. I've heard you're good. It was literally, they had this blank check in front of me, say, I need a website, write whatever you're in. If it can do this, you're paid. I want you. And I said, well, sir, hold on, sit down, tell me exactly what you need and what you want. The more he started to explain to me what he needed and what he want, the more I started to think myself and say, sir, what you're, that sounds like Wix. Like you go in, get an account with them, and you can go through their builder and build something yourself and cost them a lot less. So I said, how about you do it? I'll help you set up an account. You play around with this, see what you think. If you need some help, come back to me. He went, and I think about a couple months later, I ran into him, and he said, hey, Yarda, I just want to thank you. I'm glad for your advice, and I tried out Wix. It was everything I needed, and I have this base website up, and I just want to thank you for helping me out, and cut, like, can I offer you something? I feel like I got so much out of you, and I didn't pay. I said, look, I'm just, I'm glad to see you're doing okay, but I don't need your money, and I said, it, it, it was a blank check and it, it kind of, cause not like I was rolling in it or, <laughs> or, or singing big pimp and Jay-Z at the time, but. <laughs> well, I get it. Money's tempting, right? And, <laughs> and that's why we go into business is to make money and to cover our costs and to, to do things for ourselves and for our loved ones. And that's a, that's a, that's a tough challenge to turn down, but uh, you know, I, I can only imagine the, the goodwill and, you know, could, did that person have the budget to build a Wix? And depending on how long it is ago, you know, if you're doing WordPress stuff, page builders weren't that great four years ago. Uh, there were a lot of challenges with them, and they're very good now. But uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a tough one, and I'm glad I'm glad you shared that lesson because, especially in COVID nineteen, where money can be a real challenge, that that the quick dollar is often a very dangerous dollar to grab a hold of. Yes, and yeah, as my colleague and he, he's a business partner now. I'm actually a board member of the RIA. Joe often says, "At the end of the day, we're not the Salvation Army. We're capitalists. For better or worse, it's a capitalist country. We all like to make money, but at the same time, it's we have to consider our reputations and our conscience and our souls at night, and we don't want to go around gouging people because or cheating them because then you're only able to make but so much." And Joe, this is this is Mark Avery all over again, isn't it? Yeah. Focus on the relationship, focus on the customer, and the money will follow. Yardell Mark is a uh, the barber that I mentioned earlier in this in this conversation. Yeah, and and it's it's true. We hear, we keep hearing the same uh, or similar messages, right? Focus on the customer and the relationship and your reputation, because if you you know if you took that guy for a whirl and charged him however much you wanted to charge him to do something that he could have done for, you know, tens of dollars a year, um, he would have remembered that too. And it's better to have somebody who, uh, who's not bad mouthing you, you know, and, and not saying, oh, this guy is a con artist. So, uh, Yardell, I want to ask you just cause I'm generally interested in this. I do a lot of video tutorials and stuff like that. What is your setup for creating videos? What do you use to shoot? Uh, what do you use to edit and things like that? Well, I have a a very basic like Panasonic camera that someone recently helped me pick out. I, I forget the exact make and model. I can provide it to you after the fact. And it's a with a boom mic and some stands. I just Joe recently just got a kind of like a very simple teleprompter which is essentially a screen that you can sit a tablet in mm -hmm. so you get like the right teleprompter app it you see the text from the tablet on the screen and you can sit the camera behind it as far as the software i use i've been using a windows program called camtasia which seems like a very a more straightforward what you see is what you get versions of final cut pro mm -hmm. and at some point I know I'm going to have to get in the Final Cut Pro, but that point seems to be very far in the future because it's like Camtasia. It's like, it's, I don't want to sound like I'm making an ad for him, but like, it's really like you drag and drop. Start yeah. throwing stuff in, throwing it down, then like, okay, produce. Yeah, Camtasia is uh, very straightforward and it's used, it's used by a lot of people, um, especially in the like e-learning, online learning space. 
Awesome. Well, thanks for that rundown. I will link, uh, we will link all of this stuff in the show notes over at startlocal.co. Yardell, thanks so much for joining us. Where can people find you? Well, yeah, my main website is Perkatech. That's P-E-R-K-I-T-E-C-H dot com. My phone number is 215-325-0403. There is a landing page. It's landing.perkatech.com, which still has some rough edges, but when it's done, that's going to have all of the socials connected to as far as my Twitter, my Facebook, and my Instagram. But if you want to find me on any of those, you just look for Perkatech. Or you can just Google me, which if if you go to Google now, it will now say, oh, do you mean Perkatech? In the very beginning, when I picked, got this name for myself and started to Google myself, Google would say, oh, are you looking for Percocet? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually worried I was going to say that in the intro. I like really wanted to slow down and make sure I said the right word. I cannot tell you how many calls or conversations I got from people where it's like, you don't really sell Percocet, do you? I mean, no, you, you don't sell Percocet, right? You don't, I mean, I, I'm asking for a friend, but it's like, no, no, you don't sell Percocet, right? It's like, ma'am, sir, ma'am, no, I do not sell Percocet. I, I don't judge. I'm not law enforcement, but that's that's not my wheelhouse. That's not my inventory. Like, really? 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 No, no, you no, I'm just, forget I asked, forget I asked. Like, you know what? <laughs> that's funny and fantastic. So Percotech.com. Again, we'll link all of that in the show notes over at starlocal.co. Uh, Yardell, thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Again, thank you for having me. 